Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to part two of today's session. So I'm going to hand over the session to Graham now, and Graham, you can proceed once you're ready. Okay, will do. Let me just uh, put my screen uh, up for this second session on sales planning. So, good. Now, the last slide we looked at was this one about making appointments by telephone. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to just reflect back on before I move on to the next session. Is that um, sometimes, how can I put this nicely, this, the reputation of selling is not always held in the highest regard. Sometimes people think salespeople are dishonest sometimes, or they may oversell, or they will say anything to get the sale. They'll, they what we call in the business over promise. Uh, yes, of course, that will be possible. Yes, I'm sure we'll get it to you by Friday. Now, in today's world, in the internet led business of 2020, we cannot do that anymore. Because customers will go on their phones and they will Google things and they will find out if we're right or wrong. If we mislead them, an over promise, we will get bad reviews, complaints, and things taken further. So the best thing you can do with your customers is to try and overcome any prejudice they may have about you as a salesperson. Build rapport, ask questions, understand, and gain their trust. And if you don't know something, say you don't know. If something isn't possible, say it isn't possible but suggest an alternative this is very very important and the other thing is sometimes people get a little confused between the difference between a lead and a prospect if i gave you the full name of those terms you'll understand them better lead means an inbound lead it's a, an inquiry where somebody is contacting you or your organization a prospect the full phrase is prospective customer Let's think of a possible customer, and that's the difference. Um, always be closing means you always keep working towards your objective of a sale. It doesn't mean to say you have to keep putting pressure on people. Trust and rapport is the foundation. Move on from there. But the reason you want trust and rapport is because it will encourage them to buy from you or make a decision to choose your company. So. Now, the way you keep an appointment warm is follow up. You send a gift, you send a prize, you send a present, you send an email, <clears throat> you send a letter or a brochure, follow it up by putting it in the diary. This is, this is so, is so, so, send a proposal, follow it up. Now, if you're in a business where you visit customers or clients, um, there are a few things you can do to increase your chance of success. <clears throat> and this is true, by the way, um, if you were going for a job interview, as many of us will over the course of our careers many times, right? So preparation is critical. Research, not just their organization, but their company and their business. Uh, look at their social media, particularly their LinkedIn. Very, very important. Look at their website. Look at the news PR side of their website. Um, I was working with a client recently who sold... Uh, equipment to manufacturing organizations and they used to use Google Earth to um, look at the satellite view of the factory and the facility they would get a they could count the cars in the car park and see the size of the of the manufacturing plant and things like that always practice and rehearse your questions your presentation your openings and exits there is much more importance on the first impression and last impression of any meeting. As they say, you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. Make sure you have ready whatever resources you need to take with you to a visit, or indeed, if you're doing a Zoom or a Teams meeting, you have your slides ready and set up to share. Plan and prepare always. Get where you're going on time or five minutes early and be ready for the questions you might be asked as well. 
these seem to be obvious but trust me it's the it's, these are the things sometimes that that undermine sales people's trust and also credibility often you will come out of a meeting with a client or a potential client and go i wish i'd thought of that i'd wish i'd taken that slide in with me i wish i'd known the prices so i could give it to them one of the tip, tips i'll give you is be optimistic about the customer going ahead so make sure you've got with you what you need to take an order make sure what they're coming in to see is in stock and make sure that if they say can we go ahead you can fulfill that expectation now whilst the core of all good selling is questioning and rapport let's look at sales presentation skills how we design the proposal, how we design a presentation, and just a few of the techniques that will help when you have to do this, or indeed, if you are ever involved in this. Effective sales presentations, here are 10 tips. Always know your audience and connect with them. By audience, it could be just the one person you're selling to. Tell a story. Stories are the essence of all communication and indeed influence and persuasion. Every great presenter, every great orator, every great politician or sage or guru or religious person will communicate with stories. In sales, we want stories about happy customers. We want stories about our business that build trust and credibility. We want stories that illustrate our sales points. We need to convey one idea per slide. Visual impact is very important. Take away any distracting visuals on a slide or in an office or an environment. So if you were showing somebody around a property, for example, you may have a show home. A show home is not like your and mine houses. A show home will not have magazines or books or things left out because that's too distracting. I know sometimes estate agents, property agents will tell homeowners not just to tidy their property, but take all ornaments off the shelves so it doesn't look cluttered. It's called a noise. It's called visual noise. Always keep your presentation, and by presentation, this could be, of course, to one person, simple. Do not try and overload them with data or facts or figures. Watch TED Talks. TED Talks are a free learning presentations. There's lots of different subjects on there, but watch the presenters, watch how they present, listen to the techniques they use. If you watch five or six TED Talks, you will begin to see the similarities. They may start off with a question. Why is it that some organizations are more successful than others? They will use metaphors. They will stick to one big idea. They will speak slowly and clearly. They stand still. They don't use many slides, which is my next point. Practice without slides and only use the slides to support your talk if you feel it's necessary. And by slides, by the way, you could use visuals, you could use posters or charts um, or, or maybe the view from a window or anything at all that is a visual influence. Think about the questions you might have if you were a customer and anticipate the questions and objections your client may have. Now, let's call them concerns. And um, maybe the concern is something they will ask you later. So build the answer into your presentation. So therefore, you can then refer back to it when the question comes up. So, for example, if they uh, you're doing your exhibition sale and the customer says or the prospective customer asks may ask you, um, 
what other publicity will you be doing to promote the event to make sure you have lots of visitors? Well, include that information in your presentation so that when they ask, you can say, well, as I said in my presentation, we are running a television advertising campaign plus newspapers and email marketing to drive visitors to the exhibition. Finally, any short or even long presentation should have a clear action following it. The next step, follow these tips and your sales presentations, even just talks to one person, will be more effective. Focus on your audience, but also focus on yourself. Think about what your audience needs, wants, and is relevant to them. Only talk about the features, the benefits, the things that concern them, or most likely concern them. If you are um, presenting in person, how you're dressed, your, your grooming, your um, whole ambience, your whole look is important. The materials you use, your tailoring, by the way, is not about your clothing. The tailoring is about the ability to personalize your presentation to that individual customer or company. Even just putting their name or logo on a slide deck or referring to their business or their location or their products, using their name and telling stories that build credibility and sell through implication. Very, very important. Just take a very simple example. You work in a car showroom. Somebody walks in, walks into the showroom, they're an inbound lead. By asking questions, you understand if they are a prospective customer. You ask them what they're looking for. You ask them what's most important. You ask them why they're looking to change a car, what they would want in a future vehicle, what's most important to them, and so on. And from that, you would then go and show them a brochure or maybe a vehicle and take them for a test drive. Everything about that process needs to be impressive. It needs to be impressive. You see, when it comes to presenting information, everything counts. Everything counts. It's either moving a prospect towards buying from you or moving you away. So you come to do a test drive, but you can't find the key or there's dirty marks on the car or the, there's no brochure. All of these things don't work. If the person said that fuel economy was important to them, don't tell them about how comfortable the seats are. Talk about the fuel economy. This is, this is absolutely key. You've got to demonstrate that you've listened to your client. Try and implement this rule of three when you're using, when you're talking in a sales context. Make it compelling with the structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Very often we use the Aristotle triptych technique, which is known as the three T's. It's like they do on the television news. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and you tell them what you've told them. You give them an agenda, you then go through the agenda, and then you summarize at the end. Always keep it simple. Keep it short and simple. Keep it super simple. Allow them to ask questions, which is also important. And keep the audience engaged. Move it forward and use language that is simple and compelling to understand. We've mentioned this already, the AIDA technique, attention or awareness, interest, desire, and action. It's a very, very simple model, but it's very well proven. Always try and structure information about that. Now, in a sales situation, attention is how is it relevant to me? Interest is about features or facts or functions. Desire is about benefits. In action is what the next step is or to how to find out more information. Often there's a conversation I have with salespeople and also marketing people as to what is the difference between a feature and a benefit. 
Now, a feature is a fact about something. A benefit is the value. And in between is something called an advantage or a function. So if I was um, presenting um, a, a product for sale, for example, let's say, imagine I'm, I'm trying to sell you this laptop I'm working off. And I might say, well, this has a, a nine gigahertz battery or something. I don't know what the measure is of a battery. And you go, wow, what does that mean? <laughs> right? It doesn't mean anything. It's just a fact. What does it mean? It means it'll go for 10 hours without being recharged, which means you can work all day without being near a plug point. So if you travel a lot, you can keep working. That's a benefit, right? So um, which means that is a phrase we link a feature with a benefit. Simple feature, which means that benefit. Now, benefits, if you want a nice big list, here's a few to put on it. A benefit is saving time. People spend a lot of money to save time. Saving money is a big benefit. Reduced hassle, trouble, and problems. So easing, ease of business, more convenient. Once again, people will pay more money because it's easier and more convenient. Or choose you because you're the easiest to deal with. Status, prestige, peace of mind, um, simplification, improve results. Okay, all of these things are benefits. Easier, faster, quicker, better, cheaper. Use these adjectives and talk about benefits. Um, this, is, this is the dynamic between feature and benefit. Now, um, when you're presenting, things go well. Ta-da, plan A. But sometimes things don't go so well. So have a plan B. You're doing a nice big presentation and you suddenly realize the four or five people on the client side are looking rather bored and fed up. Plan B, stop the presentation, go to questions. <laughs> right? Um, you turn up to do a presentation or the client turns up to see the property and they say, we've only got 10 minutes, not the half an hour we thought we had. So plan B is let's do a quick tour and then talk to them about their buying situation and, and what they think of it, right? So plan A, plan B. Making a sale is more important than sticking to your plan. Very, very important. How do you excel at a presentation? Well, you excel by doing some of the things I've already mentioned, but also to understand the dynamics of how we communicate as human beings. Um, this was a this was discovered many years ago by Dr. Merabrain, and he came up with this very simple but profound model. Fifty five percent, or over half of all our input communication, is based on visual input. Thirty eight percent is based on voice tone, and seven percent is based on words. So that's what we say, how we say it, and then the look on our face or our body language as we say it. So I'm going to come back to the body language in a moment because, to be honest, we could do a whole day on body language. It's that, it's that important. But let's go back to the words. If I said, um, oh, this is, this is an excellent opportunity to present your company at a major exhibition, does that really sound exciting? This is a major opportunity to present your company as an exciting exhibition. It's not working for me, right? So it's voice tone. This is a major opportunity to present your company at this exciting exhibition. Okay, now it's sounding better, right? Now it's sounding better. So we always believe the voice tone four times more than the words, right? So make sure you emphasize the keywords. You put enthusiasm, confidence, and empathy into the sentences you use when you're talking to customers. This means making more modulation, more up and down. The word you emphasize creates the meaning. The customer asks you for a proposal so they can present it to their manager tomorrow. 
you say, sure, I can get that over to you today before five o'clock. That doesn't sound great, does it? Sure, I can get that over to you today before five o'clock. Now, I sound committed and I sound keen. Now, of course, you don't want to overdo this because you just sound, sound crazy. But let's come back to the body language. Well, in body language, we tend to keep it relatively calm in business, certainly. Unlike, say, children in a school playground who are just crazy, right? We've learned as adults to control our body language. But there are certain aspects of our body language we cannot control, and they're called micro behaviors. They're to do with things like eye movement, pupil dilation, skin tension, coloration, slight differences in our breathing rate or our posture. And we, we, tend to, we tend to really notice these unconsciously at the back of our mind. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine you're talking to somebody and they say, yeah, OK, well, listen, I'll give you a call and we'll, we'll set it up. And there's something about the way they say it that you, makes you think they're not going to call me. Right. So it's kind of interesting how this works. This is called, by the way, where the words and the voice tone don't match the body language. This is called incongruence. You might think you can tell a fib to a customer. You might think you can go, yeah, of course, we'll get that by Friday. But don't ever think the customer won't know, because the chances are particularly experienced people will have a BS detector in their head and they can tell the difference between a yes, no problem and a yes, no problem. The differences are minor but they're very important. So here's three things you can do to make this work. Number one, say fewer words. Speak in chunks, in little groups of seven to 10 words. Watch the documentaries and the presenters on your television or YouTube channels. They will speak in small chunks. Emphasize the words make believability in your sentence that you want people to remember and then also concentrate on putting across a positive body language and maintain eye contact with the customer at all times if you're face to face okay really important um, if you're not by the way face to face or on the phone don't multitask don't try and do something else because the customer will sense that and they can probably hear the clicking of a keyboard too. Now, the world changed when Microsoft brought out PowerPoint and we all suddenly had a visual, easy to use, quick to produce system for presenting information. PowerPoint is no longer a novelty. There are even better systems now. You can make short videos, you can make cartoons, you can make those hand drawing things, but it's still a go to tool for sales presentations. So here are some concepts we're going to go through. How to use PowerPoint or how to deliver good product demonstrations, how to use presentations in a meeting, how to use it in terms of customer needs and linking the presentation to the customer's requirements and how to use it to facilitate discussion, questions, and plan those questions. So let's go through a few of these points. Now, a demo presentation to a customer or a group of customers, or even showing them around, let's say, going back to my property sales example, if you were going to show somebody around a home or an office or a facility, facility that you were selling or renting, you need to be prepared. You need to have a flow, a plan, and a structure. Very simple. A real estate agent will start off probably at the front door, okay? And they will work their way through the ground floor, and they'll go upstairs, and they work their way through the, the top rooms, 
and they come back down. Now, what's difficult about that? But what they would do is they would plan what they call focus points. So let's imagine you go into the lounge and the lounge has got a very impressive fireplace. So they walk over and they stand by the fireplace and they talk to the prospect there about the room and the features and the window and so on. Then they go into the kitchen and maybe the kitchen has a really lovely view. So they stand by the window. This time the customer can look out of the window and they say, the nice thing about this room is the fantastic view. And they stop talking and allow the customer to look at the view. And they go upstairs in one of the bedrooms. It has an amazing closet with fitted wardrobes. Guess what? That's what they spend time showing them. And then they come back down to the, what they call the hot spot. And the hot spot is the best room or the best part of the property they think the customer will be interested in. So if you were showing around a family and they, were, they told you that the garden was the most important thing they were looking for, you would come back down and stand in the garden. Okay, so the structure of the demonstration is always about tailoring it to the client or the prospect's interest level and making sure that you keep it simple, but you keep it structured. This is very important. If you have, a, as you can see here in the, in the picture, a software product or an application or something complicated, don't make it a training course, make it a sales presentation. Always start with an impactful statement, a rhetorical question or the best feature. Stay focused. Keep people curious. Don't give them too much information. Don't lose yourself to the product or the whatever you're demonstrating. Be charismatic. Be friendly. Always empathize. Understand the customer. If they say, oh, yes, this is a nice room, but there's no storage space in it. So, yeah, you're right. There isn't. There isn't. A, you could probably put some storage in, but I understand what you're saying. So empathy means connecting with somebody's view or feelings. It comes from an expression that says, before you argue with someone, walk in their shoes. See the world from their side of things. You might be thinking, well, who needs storage? It's a fantastic big room. You could easily put some bookcases in. But that's not the answer. The answer is, oh, I see. Yes, you're right. There isn't very much storage in here. Good point. Engage. Show the solution. Make it memorable. Always, always, always emphasize benefits and come to a conclusion, which, if nothing else, is a summary of what you've just told them in terms of benefit, solution, and the key points. Now, the memorable and engagement comes with a story. It comes with a for example. It comes with an illustration or a video of some kind. So you might want to paint a picture or explain how something might be done. So for example, if you were going back to the um, exhibition, you would want to make it uh, uh, engaging and memorable by talking about the success of other exhibitors in previous years and how your visitor numbers have gone up every year for five years and the kind of publicity and that they would have an entry in an exhibition guide and so on and so on. So all the time, keep adding the benefits. It's kind of true, though, is not to talk past the sale. Try and keep your major selling points, if you like, to three to five main points. This is proven to be more effective than having, say, 20 uh, or 10 or something. OK, now, when you structure your sales presentation, the best place to start is by reviewing your customers needs. So you might start a presentation by saying, thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'd like to start by just reviewing some of your requirements and objectives we spoke about in our last meeting. And off you go. If you were selling, for example, a complicated software solution or um, some advertising or consulting services where it's a very um, complex but also personalized solution, start your presentation 
by recapping and sharing your understanding of the customer's requirements and needs. One of the things a customer always has to understand is why your solution is right for them. Very important. Um, an opportunity is what drives sales. And classifying or defining that opportunity is different to every business. It needs to be qualified. Now, qualification means assessing is the opportunity, number one, real, number two, is it winnable, and number three, what do I have to do to close that sale? So let me give you an example. Um, if, you if you were, let's say, a law firm, and you had an inquiry through from a big company to say they were looking to change their legal representatives and wondered if your company would like to bid. So is this an opportunity? Well, yes, it is. So what you have to do is scale, first of all, is it winnable? What's it worth? And what do I need to do to close it? Now, here's a very simple process, which I call the match model, M-A-T-C-H that will allow you to qualify opportunities very easily. Okay, M is, of course, for money and budget. Can they afford it? How will they pay for it? Has the budget been approved if it's a business-to-business -business sale? A is for authority. Am I dealing with a person who is going to make a decision? Or is it somebody else's decision? Now, in a business-to-business -business sale, there's normally two or three people who are consulted or involved. So the question would be, apart from yourself, who else will be looking at this solution? Time scales, when are they looking for installation, not decision? When would you looking, be looking to move in? When would you be looking to purchase this? Competition and alternatives is the C. What other cars, what other properties, what else have you seen so far? And H is for hot button. Now, a hot button is something that if you keep pressing, if you keep focusing on, if you keep mentioning, the customer will respond more. And the question is, apart from price, what's most important to you in choosing a property, a car, a handbag, a mobile phone, a camera, etc., etc. So we know price is always a consideration. People have a budget in their mind. They don't want to spend more or less than a certain level. So apart from that, what are two or three things that's most important for you? And they may say, it must have this, it must have this, and I would like it to have this. Now, this is going to tell you what you have to focus on or deliver to gain the sale. Okay. So, so this, is, this is how qualification works. Now, another piece of jargon, you can have so much jargon after this session, pain point. So we've got prospecting, we've got opportunity, we've got lead, we've got cold call, we've got warm call. Now, this is like a pain point, right? So a pain point is a problem that a customer wants to have solved. It's the it's the it's the the difficulty, it's the pain, it's the um, challenge that means they need a solution, right? So if somebody inquired about exhibiting at your exhibition, it's only because they have a problem. The problem is they need more leads. They need a way of raising the profile of their business to certain customer base. They need to find a way of demonstrating their, their market positioning. They need to connect with existing customers. Um, they need to be seen to be doing more in their market. Maybe the marketing department need to do more activities to support the sales team. An exhibition would be a good one. So solution to a problem is a great way to present your product or solution. And ask customers, what problems would my product solve okay so take the pain away is an important part of any sales motivation 
value proposition or value prop as we call it in sales what's your value prop now this is a short sentence known as an impact statement or an elevator pitch that explains the value of what you do right um so let me give you an example if you were a real estate agent and a company contacted you to sell or an individual contacted you to sell their property for them they may contact several estate agents or several real estate agents and they're going to say why would i choose your business why would i choose you right and you would have to be able to explain how you're better better value or have more credentials than other businesses of a similar type this is your value proposition and realistically you've got about 30 seconds to do this right 30 to 60 seconds this is the science this is absolutely the science so you might say um, as a real estate agent we've been working this area for 15 years we've sold some of the best and the uh, some of the best properties in this area we are very efficient very effective and nice people to work with now um, is that a good value proposition well it's a good starting point it's about making sure that you differentiate say differentiate yourself but also explain what you're good at a nice way of starting a value proposition is with a phrase we specialize in or i specialize in and i help organizations too and remember the benefit statements before save money save time efficiency uh, more convenience status those kind of things all right so that's the value proposition model value prop you need to have your value prop really well defined now how to ask questions is an essential part of the sales model uh, let me just show you this this is a this is a book by a guy called neil rackham it's called spin selling it's in your notes it's probably it's a few years old now but it's still one of the definitive books on the subject of selling. Um, Neil Rackham was, uh, and, I, and I've worked with him, I have to say, he's, he's an interesting guy. Uh, he's a trainer and he's a consultant, and he was asked by IBM to improve their sales model. This is going back uh, 30 years now. And he went out with some of the best IBM account managers and salespeople, and he decided to study their approach, write it down, and teach it to everybody else so that they could be as effective. And this was a time when 20% of the sales team made 80% of the sales. And so one of the things he noticed is that the, the um, top salespeople asked a lot of open questions, and they asked a lot more questions than the others. So he put a training program together, and he said, right, we're going to teach everybody to ask nice open questions and ask lots of questions. And, and sure enough, these people that were trained went away and they asked more open questions and they asked lots more questions, but they were no more successful. So Neil had obviously failed to find the golden key to unlock sales potential. So he went back again and he modeled the salespeople and he found they asked the questions in a particular sequence which is the word spin. He asked, they asked questions about the customer situation. They asked questions about the problems, the implication of those problems, and the need payoff, or what, what is also known as value. Now, this is a very good way of structuring a question. So what do you do now, currently, in this situation? How do you promote your business, et cetera, et cetera? What challenges do you find? What results do you get? How well does that work? What would you like to change or improve? These are the problems. You, you may not find that asking them what problems they have actually gets the right answer. How effective, how confident are you this is working well are much better questions. Then with the implication, you do a what if. So what if you were able to? What would be the advantage? If we could save you 15% of the cost of your current advertising, 
what would you do with that saving? How would that be of benefit? This is a need payoff. Situation, problem, implication, need payoff. If I could, how would that benefit you? So this is a really powerful structure for selling. Okay, so let's take the homeowner and they contact you and they say, we're looking for a property in this area. Can you help us? And you say, yes, I can. Tell me what sort of house you have now. Where are you living? What do you, you know, where do you live? What do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? What would you like to change or improve? And what kind of problems does that cause you? Either now or in the future. So then tell me what you're looking for ideally. That's the need payoff. And then that's your model that you would then use to recommend the right property to them. And in that process of asking questions, of course, it would take longer than I just demonstrated. You would build rapport, you'd build empathy, and you'd build credibility. You would give the client the feeling that you care, right? And, and there's the thought, right? If, you, if you're going into sales, um, the customer does not care how much you know until they know how much you care. If they sense you have the customer's best interest at heart, they will work with you and trust you, right? Now, here are some criteria for a good question. It should be short. I mean, we're talking 10 to 15 words. We don't want long explanation questions. It should be easy to understand but difficult to answer that is thought provoking it needs to be unambiguous so it's not confusing in terms of the person doesn't really understand what you're asking it needs to be relevant to the sales process or contact by the way don't ask questions you can find out the answer to somewhere else because you're wasting your customers time so if you're visiting a company and you say, you know, what is it your company does or how many employees do you have? Forget it. You can find that out. You should have looked that up and the customer is going to think you're an idiot. Well, at least not very prepared. Make sure it's related to the objectives that the client has. It's very clear and easy to understand. I say it slowly, be direct, make it comprehensive. Don't use jargon, common vocabulary. Do not use jargon. I have won, I can't tell you how many, but I've won a significant number of sales when I was working in the IT and software areas of industry by simply not using jargon. I didn't put up pictures of fluffy things and talk about clouds and this net and that net and, and protocol speeds and X25 this and X25 that. I just used everyday language and that built people's trust. And make sure it's directed at the right person if you're working in a group of people. Okay, so make sure that you're, you are ticking the boxes with all of these thoughts. Ask the right questions, listen carefully, and don't talk too much. So opening questions, open questions are what, where, when, how. Definitely good questions. They tend to get factual information. Probing questions, I always remember it by using the TED acronym. Tell me, explain, or give me an example, or describe in more detail. Tell me, explain, describe, TED. Very, very easy, good probing questions. Or just simply go, okay, that's a good point, what else? And just pause and say, oh, that's interesting, and let them keep talking. Let them keep talking. And the closed question is always a question that starts with a verb. Do you, can you, does it, will it, and so on. Now, closed questions are great for building confirmation. So you're looking for a nice kitchen, yes? Great. Uh, is a garage important to you? Yes. All right. Is it important to be close to the internet, in, uh, having a good internet? Yes. Bang. Closed question. But be careful of closed questions where a no would be a bad thing. So if you are in a retail, luxury retail store and somebody walks in, and we've all had this happen to us, the salesperson comes over and says, hello, sir, good morning, can I help you? And you go, no, thank you, I'm just looking. 
Oh, OK. And they walk away. <laughs> what a stupid question. How can I help you? How are you today? What are you looking for specifically? So, you know, these kind of questions would be so much better. And there's a question called a double bind question, choice of two questions. Um, I remember working in a, a mobile phone company and the sales guides walk up to people and go, hi, can I help you? And they go, no, thanks. Just looking. OK, I'll be over there. Right. And they change the question to, hi, are you looking for a phone for yourself or somebody else? Are you looking to change your phone or just browsing the new models? And they go, no, no, I'm not looking to change my phone. I, I just like to see what's in these days, what, what's new. OK, great. We've got a couple of new uh, phones just over there. Let me know if you want more information. You've started a conversation. You've started a relationship. So think very carefully about how you phrase questions. That's the great book, or any book on questioning, by the way. Da -da -da. Learn to ask questions in sales. Now, closing is one of the kind of key things about selling. There's a lot of um, misunderstanding, let's call it, about closing. Somehow it's kind of some mysterious, high-pressure, tricky-dicky technique where you force people into buying things. No, not at all. It's about, first of all, overcoming customer questions and objections. Then it's about um, using different methods to conclude the sales process and either gain an order or not. All right. So possibly somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of sales will end without a close, without without an order. Right. So there's always a chance of that. But trust me, it would be much higher percentage that didn't go to an order if you didn't close effectively. It is possible to double your conversion rate by learning to close better. And by the way, conversion rate is one of the measures of sales effectiveness is how many, say, quotations or proposals or uh, demonstrations turn into orders. And trust me, this varies a lot. It varies a lot. And most of it is down to two aspects. How well you build rapport and friendship in the first part of the sale, then how well you close, right? So um, very, very important. And it can be done so well, it's actually almost unnoticeable. And it can be fun too. It really can be quite fun, right? Um, so if a salesperson turns to a customer and says, so would you like to go ahead? And the client, the prospect can turn around and say, well, I might do if you made the price a little more attractive. Oh, OK, let me see what I can do. And you go into some sort of if I did, would you and so on. So um, it, it's these kind of events that we need to focus on. So now how to put your story across in the customer language. All closes start with a summary. So at some point, you've asked your questions, you've done your presentation, you've shown them the property, you've given them a price and a proposal, and you summarize, okay? And this is based on the Greek idea of pathos, ethos, and logos. So pathos is emotion. Ethos is credibility. And this tends to be uh, about proof and ethics and, and status. And then logos is logic, which tends to be facts and figures. OK, so we combine these three to put our stories across as a summary, highlighting what's most important to the client. OK, so the framework of telling a story is very important. A setting, characters, conflict, resolution. So the conflict might be, the, the difficulties, the problems, the issues that occur, and the way it's solved. So a story, for example, is you might say, let's imagine you're doing the exhibition, and you've presented everything, and you're just about to ask the customer if they'd like to go ahead. And you say, well, we had a customer last year, and they were a small startup business, and they'd never done an exhibition before, 
and they weren't sure if it was going to be valuable for them. They weren't sure if it was going to be successful. And, and there was quite a bit of argument between the directors as to whether it was a good idea or not. Um, but they decided to try our exhibition and they took a small stand and they found it to be very effective. They gained some new leads, they connected with existing customers and they've now come back and they're taking a bigger stand this year. So a little story like that will warm and set the foundation for your close. All right. A sales aid, a presentation, an image, a visual, as I said before, with a property example, actually being in the, in, the, in the best place in the property will actually support your closing efforts, right? Um, if you were selling a luxury retail item like a handbag or a, a brooch or a watch, okay, or a car, they're sitting in the car, use the sales aid. Give them a mirror. Let them see it on. Let them admire it. Then ask a test closing question, right? While they have that peak moment of emotion. I'll give you an example of that in a moment, but let's do that now before we ask about objections. So let's imagine, yes, somebody is trying something on. They've got a very expensive jacket or a lovely um, necklace, um, or they, they're looking at the, the proposal that you've given them, okay? And so you just ask them then a test closing question. While they are focused, while they are admiring it, while they're, you know, they're really positive, and they say, so what do you think? How does it look? Can you see this as being something of benefit? Whatever you have as a, as a test closing question. And this is in response to their buying signals. Um, a buying signal is a question about something, uh, particularly if it's a, it's a, a when, not if. It's an expression of interest. It's kind of, yes, I can see that. Oh, that'd be good. Oh, excellent. I like that. Oh, that looks really nice. Then you say, so what do you think? And I go, yeah, I think it looks really nice. So then you ask a closing question. So would you like to take it? Would you like to buy it? Would you like to go ahead? Would you like to put an offer in if you're buying a property, for example? Now, this is a closing question. And a closing question will often draw out the yes buts. And sometimes there are no yes buts. They go, yes, I would. Fantastic. Great. Do the paperwork. Make the sale go home. <laughs> Don't complicate things if the customer says, I'd like to go ahead, right? Um, you'll be amazed how many people, you know, I, you know, you go in and say, I'd like to buy this, please. Okay, let me ask a few questions first. No, just take the credit card, right? Make it really simple. Uh, give them great service, reassure them, but don't overcomplicate. All right. One of the things that, that is true today, and it's always been true, is just be really easy to buy from. I mean, trust me, that is such a rare thing. Um, even in a business-to-business -business environment, you need to buy a new photocopier. You phone companies up, and they, and they come around and do a demonstration. They then take two weeks to give you a proposal that you don't understand. It's all too complicated. And then, they, then you ask them questions they don't understand the answers to. And then they say, well, it's 12 weeks for delivery. What? I just need a copier, right? So being really easy to deal with is such a joy in selling. So what do you think? Do you want to go ahead? Yes, but. Ah, oh, well, we're not sure. It's a lot of money. Um, it's not my decision. Um, how can you guarantee the results? Um, yes, but the, this is not right or that's not right, okay? Now this is where you or a salesperson start to earn your money. This is where you show what you're good at, right? Um, if you think about it in a way, there could be two kinds of salespeople. There's order takers and there's closers, right? So an order taker is someone that presents everything, asks all the questions, the customer says, yeah, sure, I'd like to go ahead. And you say, fantastic, here's the payment, here's what you would do, here's the booking form. Ta da That's an order taker. A closer is someone who can turn around a yes but, and then a few minutes or a few days later, bang, they've made a sale, right? So this 
is where you put yourself on the, on the side of the champions by becoming a closer. Now, let's look at this. Um, a customer objection is a concern. That's all it is. Um, and I've given you a few examples, um, but let me give you a few more. So let's imagine the customer says, well, it's, it's more, more than I wanted to spend. Or um, I can, I've seen it cheaper online. Or, um, well, I do like it except for X and Y. There's something wrong with it. You know, there's, uh, the, the garage is too small or, you know, there's not enough bathrooms or something else, something else. Okay. Um, and you listen. And you listen carefully. And many of the times the objections will run out after six or seven. But there's only two kinds of objections. There's what we call major concerns or minor concerns, right? So um, let's imagine you're, you're selling your, your, your fancy handbag and your expensive luxury designer handbag. And what the client came in for was, let's say, a Kate Spade. But what they're now looking at is, I don't know, a Gucci. But they never bought Gucci before. And they're not sure if it's going to be as well made as the other bag. They know the other bag, they've got three of them. So they're not sure about the Gucci. They might wait for the Kate Spade bag to come back in stock. So, all right, you acknowledge. You empathize. You um, listen. And then you also ask questions. This is very important. You make sure that you um, probe their concern. You ask questions about their yes, but. Yes, but I've never used Gucci before. Okay, so what's your concern? What worries you? And then you find an answer or an action plan and then confirm the point and close. So this is the, the sequence. You acknowledge it, listen carefully, empathize. That's a good point. Absolutely, I agree with you there. You're right. The garage is a bit small. And you probe why the garage is, is important. And then you answer it and you, maybe you outweigh it with another fact about the property or you, you reassure them about something or come up with an action plan. And these, by the way, you would have thought of and you would have prepared for as part of your planning, your training, and your preparation for the sales meeting. So let's imagine you're showing, talking to somebody about your exhibition and you've happened to find out they've never exhibited an exhibition before. And it would be fair to say this may come out as a concern. And you say to them, so what do you think? Would you like to go ahead? And they say, well, to be honest, we've never done an exhibition before. We're not sure if they're any good. And you say, okay, yeah, I can understand that. If you've never done an exhibition before, you, you wouldn't know, would you? Right. So what concerns do you have? And they say, well, is it going to produce any leads? Is it going to give us a, a visitor database? And you answer that question, confirm it, and then say, do you have any other questions or concerns? So you go through that process and close the sale. Now, the best way of seeing an objection is as a positive sign. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. A prospect's challenge to a rejection of a product or service is a natural part of the sales process. Common objections often have to deal with budget, authority, need, and timing. This is known as BANT, budget, authority, need, and timing. It's only natural that when you're going to make a decision, you do have some concerns or kind of thoughts about things that you want to be reassured. So this is very, very important. Always think about these five types of objection. It's not a priority, uh, which is usually expressed as we do not have time to deal with this. I have no time. I can't handle it now. I don't think we really need it. It means there's not enough pain or gain. Um, it's not up to me, which means they're going to involve somebody else. Um, or maybe uh, it, they do genuinely have to get authority and approval from somebody. Um, and that sounds expensive. Now, this is often about a price challenge too. 
what that really means is you haven't justified to me the value of your product or service or why it's better to pay more money for something which is more expensive. So you have to justify the extra cost or the extra investment required. So if they were looking at a property and the company chief executive turns around and says, to be honest, this office space is more expensive than the other office space we've been looking at. That means you haven't really explained the extra value or benefits of that office location. Maybe the prestigious address. Um, it's quicker to get to from their home. Uh, it has better facilities. Uh, the rateable value might be lower. Um, you'll be able to attract and retain staff more because it's in a better part of the, the corporate district and so on and so on. So you have to think of a set of scales. And at one end you have price and the other end you have product features or benefits. And you have to put more product features and benefits to our way, up and down, okay? So the one they say, yes, it's expensive, yes, but. Um, you cannot overcome every concern or objection. But interestingly, you don't have to because people will still go ahead. Even to say, well, I don't like this, or I don't like that, or you can't guarantee it. And this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't overpromise. And you say, well, no, I can't guarantee that you'll get leads. I can't guarantee visitor numbers. And they say, okay, well, we'll do it anyway. Right. So, so this, is, this is the important thing. So just to recap, to prepare for objections, always listen carefully, acknowledge and empathize. That's a good point. One of the things that I, I found a really useful phrase at this part of the sales process is to say, I'm glad you asked that question, all right? And this encourages the customer, by the way, to talk even more about some of their concerns. Ask questions about it and then respond with either an answer or an, out, an outweighing statement, maybe an action plan. Now, another technique, and there's a few of these that's useful to turn around an objection, is known as the three Fs, feel, felt, found. I understand how you feel. Other customers have felt the same way, but what they found is. So let's talk about the example of the exhibition stand. And you're talking to a company and there's two or three people in the meeting and they kind of get the benefit of the exhibition and some of the managers are very keen to do it. But the chief executive turns around and says, well, to be honest with you, these exhibitions are a lot of work and we're busy enough as it is. I'm not sure we've got the time to do this properly. Now, you could use the three Fs on that objection because it's a minor objection. Well, I understand how you feel, Mr. Chief Executive. In fact, to be honest, many other customers have felt the same. If they've never done an exhibition before, it may seem like a lot of work and organization. But what they found is most of the work is done way in advance and the actual few days on the stand are not that difficult when you run a rotor or a shift system. And we can help you with that. So the feel felt found is a nice conversational way of discussing and turning around particularly minor objections or minor concerns. Um, and you can plan, prepare, and practice these very, very easily. So let's talk about how we close the sale. Number one, you listen and watch for buying signals. Nodding, become more relaxed. Enthusiasm, positive comments. So if somebody walks into the, the, the dressing room and goes, wow, this is a lovely room. That's a buying signal. You choose the closing technique you're gonna try first. You use that closing technique. You close the sale, attempt to close the sale the first time. You deal with any objections and you keep quiet while the customer thinks about it. 
Let me give you a very simple example that many real estate agents are taught as part of their sales training. They tour the couple or the family or the business around the premises or the property. And they show them around and as they go around, they point out the features and the benefits and the hot spots, the nice view and the, and the cupboards and the kitchen and so on. And all the time they're looking and listening for the buying signals. And they get them back down into the, into the kitchen or maybe somewhere to, to make a discussion. And they choose what they think is the best closing technique or question to ask. And maybe the question is a direct one. Okay, so if you like the property, why don't you put an offer in? Invitational close. And they might then say, yes, I think we'd like to, or but I'm not quite sure about, and you get the final objection. But whenever you ask a closing question, it's really important to keep quiet. Don't speak until the customer does. Very often a technique is to let the customer be on their own. So sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, listen, why don't you take another look around the property? I'm going to stay down here. You walk around, take as long as you need. Sometimes you allow the customer to read a proposal in front of you, quietly, so they can think things through themselves. You cannot think and listen at the same time, at least not as well. So this is an important part of the process. Always be closing is popularized in the 60s and 70s from a style of selling that we don't really recognize or use today. Um, we are always building commitment. We are always confirming our points as we go through. But we're not really trying to put pressure on. What we are trying to do is always be connected and always confirming. So I am not of the mind to force people to make a decision. Uh, even if that were legal, it's not a good way to run a business. But do always keep in mind that the purpose of selling is to encourage people and help people to make decisions to buy your product or services from you. I also just want to recap the, the point we made earlier on about a closing ratio. Um, there are three measures of success in sales. Number one is your activity. How many orders you take? The second is the sales value, the average order value of what you're selling. And the third is your conversion from quotations, proposals, tours, presentations, if you like, to sales even in a retail example. So how many customers do you talk to in a day? And what percentage of those buy something? And what is the average ticket price of that purchase? And this is, by the way, all trackable these days. Um, so closing ratio is a very important statistic. How to get yes in any negotiation? Well, negotiation, is another topic all of its own but very simply two simple rules if the customer says you're too expensive will you come down or i'll go ahead if you include this the first rule is number one keep it tentative keep it as a maybe well i might be able to if and the second rule there's only two tentative maybe and don't give something without getting something back. Well, I might be able to include this. I might be able to give you a discount if you went ahead this week, this month, today. So the client offered for some uh, extra cost to be included in their stand exhibition space. And you said, well, I might be able to do that if you raise the purchase order today. This is the key. And it's, it's kind of the last pivot closing point. Completing the paperwork is important. If there's contracts to be signed, if there's documents to be agreed, make sure that you have them ready, they're accurate, and you follow it through. Uh, you, you do not want the, the sale to come unstuck because you haven't completed the paperwork properly. 
So why do some people not close or are slow to close? Well, there are quite a few reasons. You can see them on the slide here. Fear of rejection. We don't want to risk a no. We don't like people telling us no. We miss the buying signals. We're too busy talking or not concentrating. We make it sound too complicated. We talk too much. The fear of failure, very similar to the fear of rejection. Um, we'd rather sometimes like live on in hope that they might buy than know for sure that they won't. Maybe we don't have the right closing techniques in our, in our skill set. Or maybe we just lack the confidence, right? So these are very common, but they're all overcomable. They're all able to deal with. You can learn buying signals. You just face the fact that not everyone's going to buy from you. And if they don't, move on. There's another prospect. There's another sale. There's another opportunity. Okay. Keep quiet. Keep listening. Focus on your customer, not yourself. And learn how to close with confidence. If you were confident, how would you act? That's the question to ask yourself. Now, in my early days as a salesperson, I uh, went on training courses regularly. I was trained by some of the best companies in the world, and I was trained by some of the best sales trainers in the world. I learned at one point 26 different closing techniques. Here's just a few, okay? The scarcity close, time limited. Um, this offer closes on Friday. We only have one of these in stock. The assumptive close, how would you like to pay? The custom close, I'd include this for you if you want to go ahead now. The question close. Um, if you have no further questions, why don't we get this sorted out? The bonus close. If you go ahead today, I'll include this. The rational close. It's almost like the balance sheet or the logic close. So can you think of any reason not to go ahead? Opportunity cost close. This would be what you lose if you don't go ahead. The trial close is, um, would you like to give it a try? Sometimes known as a puppy dog close. The balance sheet close is you summarize the pluses and minuses, and of course the pluses will outweigh the minuses. And the artisan close is where you make up something very unique, where it's very personalized, where it's like a one-off bespoke package, and, and therefore they have that ownership of it. My favorite is not on that list, which is the alternative choice close. Would you prefer A or B? Would you like this model or that model? Would you like it with or without? And this approach is very similar to the question we talked about before, the double bind, the alternative choice. It's a classic close and it's very customer friendly. There it is there, the alternative choice close. All right. Whichever one they choose, you make a sale. That's the nice thing about the alternative choice close. A minor point close is what color would you like your car to be? So in summary, the, the examples I've used today are about selling advertising and exhibition space. I've talked about the property sales for a homeowner or a business, and I've given you a few for instances to do with luxury retail sales. The fact is, is, that, is that at the core, selling principles are very much the same, whether you're selling advertising or recruitment or cars or engineering or anything at all. At the core of it is the sales process, which means you have to find your prospects. You have to connect and build rapport. You have to understand and develop the themes of their requirements, their needs, their requirements, and preferences through structured, intelligent questions. You present your solution as a match to their requirements or preferences. You overcome or answer their questions and concerns. You encourage them to make a decision, and then you complete the transition into the role of customer. And that in essence, is the sales process. So in a moment, I'm just going to hand back to Anisha um, and answer a few of your questions. 
Um, I would like to remind you, though, that the end of the slide set is a quiz, a recall quiz. I would like you to take time to answer, and we will review the answers tomorrow morning. But before we finish, we've just got 15 minutes left. So let me stop my screen share and uh, ask Anisha if she would be so kind as to pick out a few of the questions that we think are a representative of, of all the questions. I think there's over 70 questions now we've got coming through uh, from this morning as well. So, um, yeah. Any questions yes. there, Anisha, that caught your eye? Yeah, I have picked out a couple of questions for you. So the first question, this one came in as anonymous question. And the question is, how can the statement customer is always right help when the customer is being extremely rude? Okay, um, <laughs> the customer's always right. Well, when they're extremely rude yeah. and also extremely wrong. Well, the fact is um, the customer is always the customer. And unfortunately, we can't always choose to deal only with nice, polite people. We sometimes have to deal with arrogant people who get things wrong. Um, but if you start to disagree with a customer or prove them wrong, the rapport will be broken. I remember once I was, I was buying a car and, the, and I, I said to the sales guy, I said, I understand this car has, I think it was like six gears. He said, no, 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 this one only got five gears. I said, really? I, I thought I read in the brochure it had six gears. No, 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 you're wrong there. I had five gears. Oh, okay. I found another garage, right? Always be respectful of the person. Move on in the conversation. If they say something which is wrong, okay, let, I'll come back to that and you go on to something else. I think with the arrogance, people don't, really understand people who are arrogant or are rude may not really understand how they appear to others they just do what they think is normal and natural um, one of the most important things that you learn very very quickly in sales like in customer service is never take anything personally okay because it's not about you it's it's about them the mood they're in their personality uh, you know, just, just something else that's annoyed them in, in the world. So just don't take things personally. But, you know, they've still got money. They've got a need. You've got a product. Make a sale. Uh, revenge is a, good, is a good quality against uh, rude people. Um, but do try and, if they're arrogant or defensive, try and build that rapport with them. Try and focus on getting them on side. Uh, you're being nice to them, getting them a drink, uh, listening to their stories, um, all of those things. Uh, very, very important. Um, by the way, if you if you have a lot of product knowledge, that will help with difficult customers because they will be impressed by your knowledge and credibility. Um, good question. I'm not sure there's an easy answer for that one, but I hope I, I gave you some ideas there. You um, certainly did, Graham. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, shall I give you the next question? Yes. An another question, please. Yeah. So this one is from Gahit. Nadreen, uh, the question is, how am I supposed to sell a product or a service that I'm not convinced about? Wow, that's a, that's a good question, right? Um, I'm going to answer that in two ways. Number one is there is no such thing as a perfect product or service. Every product or service has some positives and some negatives, okay? Um, but it's not for you to judge. It's for the customer to judge. So let's imagine I, I, mean, I, I work in a mobile phone shop, right? And I've got 20 different phones. Uh, and this is, a, this is I know, an, an iPhone, right? An iPhone. And I happen to think the iPhone is not as good as a Samsung. And it's $200 more expensive. Why would you buy an iPhone when you've got a Samsung? It's cheaper and it's a better phone. But that's not my decision, right? If a customer says, I'm looking to buy a phone, I say, well, there's two or three models that are very popular today. One is the Samsung, one is the iPhone. And they pick up the iPhone and they go, yeah, this is fantastic. Take the order. The customer makes a decision based on their preferences and choices. Um, having said that, you don't want to mislead the customer. 
if you if you want to give them a choice give them a choice but point out the down and the upsides of each of the choices um, honestly but factually try not to express an opinion but state the facts so you could say well the Samsung has the same quality of screen has a high resolution camera and longer battery life these are all facts they're not opinions the Apple on the other hand has the very famous Apple operating system which you might be familiar with if you used Apple it's also very intuitive these are facts right so the customer then makes a choice so um, if you don't believe in your product or service the first sale you have to make is to yourself you have to see it as somebody else might see it and why they would buy it uh, and this, this is very very important um, empathy is the ability to see things through the customer's eyes ambition is the is the is the drive to make a sale empathy and ambition combined make it right I mean you could you can sell yourself on anything um, any car any handbag any property uh, you think why would someone buy that but somebody does and someone's happy with it so um, and it's not your choice your choice is to represent a product or service honestly and fairly and help the customer make a decision all right that may be a wrong decision but that's the customer's decision all right so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about that I try and focus on the positive benefits the positive selling points of your product and not worry about the negatives as long as of course you're not selling something fake or illegal right so um, you know there's, here's a here's an example right um, sometimes in properties they uh, they have the furniture in show homes of properties they have the furniture made smaller to make the room look bigger okay <laughs> which is which is a bit of a trick right and uh, I know retail property agents have said uh, they think that's a bit sneaky that's a bit sneaky but on the other hand the brochure has the room sizes in so yeah um, if you really feel if you really feel that you cannot sell that product or service move to a company where you do believe in the product or service um, it's so much easier if you're enthusiastic about what you sell I mean really enthusiastic so um, I like that question um, and I'm sure that we could spend more time talking and I'm sure some of you would have some thoughts on this too um, I think we've got time for just one or two more questions Anisha Sure. So here's another question for you. I noticed uh, multiple people ask this question. Yep. Uh, yeah. So what is the difference between the wants and the needs of the market and what in your opinion is more important? Okay. Um, I would say the, the wants are always more important. And these are the aspirations. Okay. And the needs are the base level, right? So, for example, and the, and the wants always change. The wants are changing because of fashion or because of competitors or, 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 or changes in the way customers use, use the phone. So, for example, let's take mobile phones. Um, I need a smartphone. I cannot live my life without a smartphone. But I want one that's got um, good video on it and that's got a good camera on it because that's now much of what I use my phone for. Is watching videos and taking cameras and taking videos uh, for for podcasts and so on. I need a phone that's going to last long time with those functions being used. Um, this is now a want. Any smartphone in the store will satisfy my needs, but they won't satisfy my aspirations. Okay, um, and th this is the thing is, and I, I would put it in the category of wants, preferences. And, and and if you like um, desires so what would I like ideally and what are my requirements what's my specification what style am I looking for focus on understanding customers preferences not their base requirements good question though um, one more question please um, Anisha let's see what we've got sure yeah um, okay so this question came in from Hussein Alal Sheikh Jafar. And the question is, 
which is a more preferred way of probing by asking a closed ended question or by asking an open ended question okay good point the best way of probing is to ask open questions closed questions are about confirming information or asking for a decision open questions always start with who where what why when and how um, as Roger Kipling said in a famous poem six wise men that taught me all I knew were who why why what and who so why is that important what are you looking for when were you looking to go ahead? Um, but remember the middle category of questions I spoke of as well, which are the TED questions. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Can you describe in detail? Can you explain exactly what you mean by that? Can you give me some examples? Okay, of what else you're doing in this area? Um, but it, it's, it's really important. And by the way, when you're asking these questions, you're, you're getting the client to think and their ideas are shaping. You're also coming across as someone who's concerned and interested in them. And this, by the way, is the cornerstone of charisma. Charisma is about making the other person feel important. And you do that by asking open questions, probing questions, and reflecting back on the answers. That's a good point. Oh, I'm glad you raised that. And now, one more thing I'd think about questions is to link them together. Try not to introduce too many jumps in the conversation. So if somebody says something, you ask a question about what they've just said before moving on. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, well, I think I've just looked at the time here, Anisha. One more quick question, uh, and then we'll let these good people go back to their, to their day, if we like. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'll uh, give you another question. Let me see what I have here. Okay, so I have a question from Mohammed Osman, and he yeah. wants to know what, in your opinion, is better more sales and less margin, or less sales but more margin? Good question. More sales, less margin, more margin, less sales. Um, okay. In any product group, in any company, you have a mix of products and services. The Boston Matrix talks about cash cows and rising stars. Um, it all depends on two things. How your sales targets are measured and how your commission is paid if you're paid on commission. If you're paid on commission on sales, then focus on sales and do not worry about margin. If your commission is based on the margin contribution of each sale, then focus on the products and services and the markets and the prospects where you make the most margin. So for example, you could have um, two handbags. One is twice the price of the other, but on one handbag, you make more margin, sell more of those. A good salesman, by the way, can switch sell. It's called switch selling. So you can choose or influence which product or service the client will end up buying, right? So as a business, if I was an owner of a business, I want my salespeople to make profitable sales. So I want them to sell products that have a good profit margin. Now, salespeople tend to do what they um, are rewarded for. So I would need to um, change the compensational commission to fit what I want them to sell more of in this case profit so to come back to your answer depends on what your focus is and what your commission is but as a business owner I would definitely look at focusing on margin and not sales a lot of the time you can sell and be losing money so so focus on that um, it's a very good question to end on actually by the way very good question very thought-provoking um, and I suppose what it means is it's not just about making the sale, it's about building a business. Um, thoroughly enjoyed talking to you today, and I hope you found the session really, really useful. The slides are there for you to reflect on and go through things. Um, also, the quiz at the end, please take time to do that. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning uh, where we're looking at a new subject 
uh, one I think you'll find very interesting, which is all about strategic management, a very different topic. So let me hand back to you, Anisha, and we'll just close the session off. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Graham, for taking us through another interesting session. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for being so attentive and being such an interactive audience. Before we wrap today's session, I'd like to make a quick announcement. We have observed that some people have used email IDs other than the ID they used to apply for this program with the university. So we have got a list of 80 users who have registered on Prism using a personal email, but uh, they have not updated about this with the university. So starting this Thursday, we will be blocking access to these IDs on the Prism portal. And I'd like to request whoever is a part of this list or if you are, uh, if your user access is getting blocked this Saturday, kindly re-register on PRISM using the university ID. Uh, we will ensure to transfer your credits from your previous account to your new account. So you need not worry about that. Please note this is an important piece of information and failing to do so will result in no transfer of credits plus no certification for any courses. So guys, if your account gets deactivated this Thursday, please re-register using your university ID and we will transfer your credits of the previous course to your new account. And as mentioned, don't forget to log into PRISM and take the recall quiz for today's session. We will upload the recording of today's session on PRISM at 7 p.m. and it will be available until 10 a.m. in the morning tomorrow. Hope everyone enjoyed today's lesson and I will see you guys tomorrow at 11 in the morning for another interesting session on business skills. Goodbye everyone and have a lovely day.